September 10th. And thank you for joining us online um, on WebEx. Um, today I have Mary Lou Steeman from the Pacific Islands Fisheries Science Center, and she'll be talking about status and trends of Honu, or green sea turtles, Shalonia Midas, in the Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument. So without further ado, Mary Lou. All right, thank you, Gavin. Thank you, Annie, for the introduction. Um, so I'm here today, as Ga uh, Gavin said, representing NOAA's Turtle Wild Gene Assessment Program. I am the project leader for our Northwestern Hawaiian Island Green Sea Turtle uh, Nesting Project. Um, so that, no that means normally I'm up in the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands for the six month summer season. And we didn't get to go this year because of COVID, um, but that means I get to finally present here in the Hanama Bay seminar series. So that is a silver lining. Uh, and I get to talk to you about some of the research that we do up there. Um, let's see, we are having some WebEx difficulties. Let me make sure that this works. Okay. So first, I'm just going to give a little plug for, uh, because it is Sea Turtle Month in the Hanama Bay Education Program uh, Seminar Series. So I'm speaking today, and then my colleague, uh, Christina Kopenrath, will be speaking next Thursday about sea turtles in the main Hawaiian Islands. So while I'll be talking today about turtles up in the Northwesterns primarily, uh, she'll be talking about some of the stuff you might have heard uh, happening in the main Hawaiian Islands uh, recently. And then uh, the biology research and conservation surrounding that. And we're both gonna touch on a little bit of sea turtle biology today. Um, so there'll be some overlap there, so making sure the basics are covered. And then our colleague on in the regional office uh, covers management of sea turtles in the Pacific Islands region. Um, Irene Kelly, she'll be speaking in two weeks uh, about partnerships in sea turtle recovery a Pacific wide Ohana. Uh, so first I'm just gonna do a quick introduction into what is NOAA, the agency that I work for. So it's the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Uh, basically it's a huge team, huge team of scientists that study everything from the surface of the sun down to the floor of the ocean. Um, we look at weather, tides, currents, uh, what seafood is good to eat, uh, we we deploy satellites, we use satellite data, and we work with protected species, uh, which is where I work. Uh, more specifically, I work again for the Marine Turtle Biology Assessment Program. Uh, I work in the on Ford Island in Pearl Harbor at the NOAA facility there. And what it means, uh, or what our program covers, uh, is basically all of the um, U.S. Uh, islands and um, surrounding waters in the U.S. Pacific Islands region, or the PIR. So that includes the Mariana Archipelago uh, over on the far left there, uh, American Samoa down south, and the Pacific Remote Islands, as well as, of, of course, the Hawaiian Archipelago. Uh, the PIR covers over 2,000 islands, and it's combined uh, EZs, exclusive economic zones, um, which are highlighted here, they cover an area four times that of the mainland US. So it's a very large area that we cover, and there's only like eight of us. So <laughs> we are spread out, we all have our little projects that we work on, um, and that's why I lead the work in, um, in the Northwestern. So that's my specialty. Uh, so now I'm going to dive a little bit into turtles as a background, and I guess I should have said um, one of the things I really love about being a sea turtle researcher is getting to do outreach and um, getting to communicate our science to different groups of people. And normally it's a little more targeted, so I gave a presentation last week at the Hawaii Conservation Conference to a group of scientists and managers. Um, I also give presentations to kindergartners, seventh graders, so because um, the Hanama Bay Seminar Outreach Series is a little bit more broad audience with families and um, science enthusiasts and all that. I took a mix of things, so I hope everyone uh, stays with me here. I have um, things from my kindergarten presentations and from my 
uh, my science presentation so that I hope everyone learns something. Um, so starting with that, I'll just jump right into turtles. So where have we seen turtles before? Very popular in pop culture. Um, Finding Nemo, of course, the big one lately. Um, but a lot of people don't know that turtles are very, very old, like dinosaurs. They're over 250 million years old. Uh, the original turtles looked like lizards, as you can see there in the middle. They had really wide rib cages. Uh, and then land turtles actually evolved first before sea turtles. So they evolved and then they eventually, uh, that's tortoises and freshwater turtles. And then they eventually crawled back into the ocean about 90 million years ago. And those, and, and that's the uh, beginning of the origins of sea turtles. And that first sea turtle was called Archelon, which means ruling turtle. It was absolutely massive, uh, but it is now extinct, unfortunately. Uh, we know that turtles are reptiles, a little more background. So they have dry, scaly skin. They have to lay their eggs on land, even if they are a marine reptile. And they lay soft shelled eggs. So unlike a hard chicken egg you can crack, they're more leathery. Uh, and of course they have to breathe air. So looking at reptiles in Hawaii, I actually didn't know this before this year. Uh, we have one, only one native reptile to the Hawaiian archipelago. It's rare, but it's the yellow-bellied sea snake. And then we have, as you've probably seen a lot more of, uh, invasive reptiles. So brought in by people, often cause harm to the environment. Okay, so uh, one of the main thing that sets turtles apart from other animals and other reptiles is that they have this shell. And a uh, question I often get um, is whether sea turtles or turtles in general can are attached to their shells or if they can leave their uh, leave and crawl away. And the answer there is that it is attached. It is a part of their body. It's actually a part of their skeleton. So you can see in the picture there that the rib bones of the turtle shell are fused together. They create this plate. And then the material that's sitting on top that you see from the outside is actually made of keratin, uh, just like your fingernails or your hair. And so it's a thick layer. It's just like a thick fingernail. And that is what we see. That's what the shell is made out of. Okay, so turtles. Sea turtles, marine turtles, uh, come in a very uh, broad, uh, large range of uh, sizes. The smallest sea turtle is the Kemp's Ridley, and the largest sea turtle is the leatherback sea turtle. And if you look on the left there, you can see a little diagram that compares the leatherback to a person, so they're about the size of a person. Um, and then in the um, figure on the right, you can see actually in the background the shadow of Archelon, so that extinct ruling turtle, and how that compares to this uh, species that we have still alive today. And speaking of that really large leatherback, uh, leatherbacks are really interesting. They don't have that hard keratin shell like the other six species. Um, it's more it's leatherback, so it's a more flexible. Um, tissue. Um, they have flexible lungs. They're, they are built for cold, deep water diving. Um, normally, turtles you hear about living in the tropics. Um, these are your subtropic, even temperate um, turtles that you'll find up in Nova Scotia, off Northern California or the Pacific Northwest. So, um, and the reason that they are able to adapt, even though they're they're a reptile, they're cold blooded is that they have what's called gigantothermy, which is one of my favorite terms. Um, but it basically just means that their bodies are so large that the surface area compared to what's inside their bodies is small enough that they're able to retain all their heat. They're so big, they keep themselves warm, uh, which is really unusual for a reptile for a cold-blooded animal. And they can dive, they're the deepest divers, they can dive up to 1,000 meters or 3,000 feet. So really interesting little side note about the leatherback. And like all species of sea turtles, this is just a look down their throat. If you've never looked into the mouth of a sea turtle, 
It looks frightening, um, but they have these really interesting mouth filet uh, and in their um, esophagus that allows them to keep their food moving down into their gullet, into their stomach and not come back out. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the sea turtle life cycle before I jump into what the turtles are doing in the Northwestern. Um, so first, uh, the turtles, as a lot of people have probably already heard, the eggs are laid on the beaches at, at night by the females. The females crawl out onto the beach, uh, dig a hole. They can lay, depending on the species, anywhere from 60 to 80 to almost 200 eggs uh, in, a, in one clutch. And then the, that's not the only clutch that the female will lay that season. She'll actually um, crawl back out. She'll cover her eggs, she'll crawl back down, and two weeks later, she'll come back and she'll lay another clutch of, uh, you know, for example, green sea turtles, it's 80 to 120 eggs. So she'll do this four or five times in a season, laying, you know, around a thousand eggs a day. And that's really important because the survive, the uh, survivability of these eggs is very low. So um, it's estimated that only one in a thousand to two thousand eggs will um, reach adulthood, will become an adult sea turtle. So they lay a lot of eggs, hoping that um, one of them will make it at least. Um, and that has to do with the predators um, when these turtles are young and um, a few other threats we'll talk about later. So um, after about 60 to 90 days of incubation, the eggs will hatch and the hatchlings will work together to move the sand above them, down below them until they reach the surface. And they have to do this together. A single turtle cannot make it to the surface alone. And once they reach Oh, and I have here. So that is what turtles look like when they're hatching. And once they reach the surface, they uh, they wait until nightfall, until it cools down and it gets dark, and they know that there won't be as many predators. And then they'll all go into what's called a frenzy. They'll run, run, run down the beach, hopefully avoiding crabs, uh, birds, other predators. They'll hit the water swim over the reef, hopefully avoiding fish, reef fish, sharks, uh, birds, and um, and then swim out far, far, far offshore and into the ocean currents um, run offshore. And that's why you don't see young hatchlings. As much as I wish we saw them while we were snorkeling on the reef, um, we don't see them that young on the reef because there are just too many predators. So they actually go and they live offshore in these algae sargassum mats for years and years until they're about inner plate size, and then they'll come back to the reef. Uh, and so that's what we call the lost years. And uh, the documentary, Finding Nemo, touches on that a little bit about riding the current. Um, and then when they come back at inner plate size, these juveniles um, uh, will find their foraging grounds where they're going to eat all their foods and grow uh, their food and grow nice and big and fat. Um, green sea turtles, like the one pictured here, are herbivores, so they're going to eat a lot of uh, sea grass, turtle grass. Um, and then, uh, a lot of people don't realize sea turtles take a long, long time before they can reproduce, before they reach maturity. So it takes, uh, for example, green sea turtles 25 to 30 years before they can even start reproducing. So it's a really long time that they have to survive out in the ocean uh, until they can even lay one egg. So after that, they'll migrate to their nesting grounds, which is uh, typically where they were born. So they have this natal homing that they will return to the beach where they were born. Um, and that, and then they'll climb a sh uh, onto the beach and lay eggs, coming full circle. And females don't migrate every year. Um, so to their nesting grounds, for example, from the main Hawaiian Islands to the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands, they will only migrate every few years. Uh, in the Hawaii, it's about every three to five years. And that's really important when you start thinking about um, like 
storms coming in and I'll talk a little bit about the storms that um, damage the nesting grounds in the Northwesterns or damage to habitat or habitat loss. You know, we won't, we might not start to see the effect of these long, of these uh, immediate events for several years as the turtles are still learning and migrating for three to five years. So looking at the seven species of sea turtle uh, that exist in the world, uh, I can tell you right now the flatback and the Kemp's Ridley are the only two that are not circumtropical, meaning or and and living all all around the world. So the flatback only lives off the coast of Australia and the Kemp's Ridley in the Gulf of Mexico. But these other five species we have here in Hawaii. Um, three of the species, the leatherback, the big guy in the upper left, and then the two on the right, the olive ridley and the loggerhead, those in terms of management in the Hawaiian archipelago are more pelagic, meaning that they live um, in the open ocean, offshore, and we typically only work with them when they interact with our um, fishing industry and have interactions um, with commercial fishing. Um, but the other two, the hawksbill and the green sea turtle, or honu and honuea, are the two that you would most definitely see if you were snorkeling offshore here in the main Hawaiian island. Um, and what's really neat, if you saw a hawksbill or a honuea, it's really, really special because there are a lot of green sea turtles, um, but and they outnumber hawksbills about 100 to 1. So the hawksbills are a lot more rare. Okay, so because of that, and because of nesting in the um, in Northwestern Hawaiian Islands being primarily about green, uh, the rest of my presentation, I'm gonna be talking about Honu, the green sea, tur sea turtle. So starting off with a little bit of the science behind the management areas that we work in, um, here is a map of the Pacific from the latest green sea turtle status review as a part of the US Endangered Species Act. Uh, and it shows nesting sites throughout the Pacific uh, Islands region. And it shows that the different populations of sea turtles have been delineated into uh, distinct population segments or DPSs. So there's the um, Central West Pacific, which is endangered. There's the Central South Pacific, which is also endangered. And then the Hawaiian Archipelago falls within the Central North Pacific, which is considered threatened. And the numbers there represent the number of breeding populations estimated to fall within that population. So our population in Hawaii is unique because it resides in the most geographically isolated island group on the planet. And it's genetically distinct from other populations, whereas other populations might be migrating in and out of their distinct population segments our population is considered closed with almost no movement of individuals into or out of the region. Um, it's also unique because it's one of only three places in the world where sea turtles will actually haul out onto the beach to bath uh, or rest. And so you'll see that if you've ever been to the North Shore, Turtle Beach, um, and other places in the main Hawaiian Islands, you'll see the turtles resting, which is not a thing uh, in most places around the world. And it also allows us to have more access to the turtles um, for research purposes, um, not only having to work with them in the water or while they're nesting. Um, while our population is slowly increasing, it is still considered threatened due to a lack of diversity of nesting habitat and because those nesting grounds are very vulnerable to climate change. So if I zoom in on the Hawaiian archipelago, finally, we can see that um, the Hawaiian Islands are made up much more than just the eight populated islands to the south. The uninhabited northwestern Hawaiian Islands extend over 2,000 kilometers past the main Hawaiian Islands, and they're protected by their status as being part of the Pahanao Mokuakea Marine National Monument. Uh, the monument was created in 2006 and expanded in 2016, and it's internationally known for its cultural and natural values, which makes it a really unique and special monument. Um, so like Hanama Bay, it's, uh, the wildlife there are protected from uh, human interactions 
and it's really well managed by NOAA, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, uh, the state of Hawaii. Um, and although it is very remote, so there are less chances of human interactions with the wildlife um, up there. Um, and it's the third largest protected area in the whole world after the Cook Islands and Antarctica. And for scale, um, I have here the monument overlaid on the U.S. You can see how long it extends over across over half the U.S. So there is a green sea turtle nesting throughout the, the monument, the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands. Um, and it's actually something that we're looking more into in recent years is trying to get a better idea exactly of what the numbers of nesting, number of nests, number of females that are migrating to these different islands and not just to their main um, nesting site, which I'll get to in a moment. And what, and especially important now as they're primary nesting site gets damaged um, for an end with climate change and things like that. So definitely nesting on other islands, very low numbers, although we're very excited to see that this is the island of Luzianski. And uh, if I overlay the nests that we found there in 2019, we had a lot more nesting there than we had anticipated before. So another one of our sites that we're working with the Hawaiian Monks of Research Program to better monitor and find out what's going on there. So going back to our map, I talked about primary nesting site for our Hawaiian turtles, our Honu, and that is Lalo, our French frigate shoal. And that is where over 96% of our population migrate to to nest. And that's incredible for a population. And that's why the population is still threatened, is it's just such a vulnerable site. It's, a, it's an egg, all eggs in one basket type of situation. So, uh, especially the fact that French frigate shoals is made up of low-lying islets at a relatively high latitude that makes this nesting site highly susceptible to climatic events and an ideal site for us to go study that. So if I look at Lalo or French frigate shoals, um, it's quite large. Uh, it's over 20 miles long, so it's not a, a small place, although the islets that make up the atoll are pretty small. Uh, within the atoll, a majority of the nesting has historically occurred on Pern and East Island. So that's where we've been conduct conducting our population assessment study. Pern Island on the left is a 10 hectare former airport used by the military Coast Guard and U.S. Fish and Wildlife. Today, uh, its crumbling seawall and dilapidated buildings pose a significant entrapment hazard to birds, monk seals, and honu. East Island on the right, uh, pictured prior to 2018, uh, it was a three to four hectare coral, rubble, and sand island, so it's a little different. And despite its smaller size, it had shown resilience to winter storms for over 2,000 years. And we know looking at the geological records that this island had been there and had been a decent size for a long, long time. It was not very dynamic. Um, East Island has also historically supported more than half of all the nesting activity at French Frigate Shoal. So it's where uh, us, uh, us researchers have been camping out to monitor the population and the females that are nesting there since 1973, a really long time. Um, the primary goal of our research at French Frigate Shoals is to uniquely identify and tag all of the individuals, male, female, oh. and juvenile. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Had a guard dog situation. Hey, okay. Um, so at... Um, French frigate shoals, we are uniquely tagging all the individuals. So we do that with um, external metal tags. We do that with internal chips, like a pet would get, a, uh, a microchip tag. And we do that with uh, white non-toxic paint, which you can see there in a few of the photos. Um, and we identify them and we measure them and we collect uh, nesting information, like how many eggs they laid, um, and from 2016 to 2018 is part, and actually 2019 now, 
as part of our increased research efforts, our field teams were deployed for up to six months completely off the grid in order to achieve saturation tagging of every turtle observed nesting or basking on East Island and now Turn Island. Um, and it's easier to show photos from the daytime, but as you can see one there, we do a majority of our work at night because that's when the females come ashore to lay their eggs. Uh, so we work a lot with red light. Um, so a little bit about the field camps, uh, because that's usually what we get the most questions about is living up there alone or alone in small groups um, off the grid. So to prepare for these long seasons, uh, we do a lot of training. We do small boat certifications. We do boat maintenance and repair because we don't get any resupplies. We don't get any help. We get dropped off with all of our food and supplies for all of those months. Uh, we do wilderness first aid, same reason. Um, we uh, train our teams, obviously, in data collection and entry, photo ID, survey techniques, um, animal handling. So you can see the on the right, the lower photo is a sea turtle handling uh, training, and then the photo above it is a monk seal training or handling training. Although that is a field camper in the in the net there. Um, and we also tr uh, train our teams on specimen collection and necropsies if we encounter any deceased animals while we're up there. Um, and then, so that takes about a month. And then also during that month while we're training, we are purchasing, packing, and loading. It's, it's a lot of packing. Um, we shop for all of our food. We bring all of our um, food up, as I mentioned, all of our water. Uh, all of the emergency uh, supplies that we need, all of our research supplies. Uh, it's a lot of buckets. Everything usually goes into buckets. That's easier loading onto the ship. And then we also follow very rigorous quarantine procedures because the monument is such a special and remote and protected place. Uh, we don't want to bring anything from the main Hawaiian Islands or elsewhere up into the monument where pests, insects, rats, vegetation, anything could harm the natural wildlife that we have up there, which is fairly pristine. So we take everything at, very seriously regarding quarantine. And even the clothes we wear need to be brand new or having only been worn on that island, it gets frozen, it gets treated. So it's a, it's a lot of work to get ready. Um, but once we get there, we, we have to unload everything that we loaded onto the ship for so many days we set up canvas tents, uh, which is where we live uh, for the months. We live on the island four to six months. Um, let's see, we use small boats from the ship to get our gear to shore. And uh, more camp preparations and camp life. So obviously we go to the bathroom while we're up there. So the center photo is two of our field campers digging a very nice lua or toilet hole for us. Um, it takes I'm getting used to, but it's really not bad. It has some of the best views I've ever had going to the bathroom. Um, we compete with laundry space, with wildlife, um, with birds. Um, in our tents, it's not, it's pretty cozy actually. We have a kitchen tent, we have an office tent, uh, and we have personal sleeping tents. Um, and two of our islands, so in combining with the Monksil Research Program, has five camps, and we, the turtle program, only have one camp at this primary nesting site. So we're at French Frigate Shoals, and we also do a lot of boating, but that allows us to uh, gather data um, from the other islets uh, around the atoll after the ship leaves and goes back to Honolulu. Okay, so focusing back on all this work we've done since 1973. Uh, here you can see all of the numbers of nesting females of the data that we've collected. Uh, and what it shows um, is that we have a 3.2 annual growth of nesting females at East Island at our old primary uh, field camp site. And so while they are increasing, the number of females are increasing, again, they are all nesting in these areas that are pretty vulnerable to climate change. Um, after that 45, uh, now 47 years of collecting census data, 
Our program went back to some of the literature and decided that we wanted to ramp up our research and collect as much contemporary nest dynamic data as possible. And then we wanted to use that data to improve our population and climate change models. So it wasn't enough just to look at how many females were coming up and laying their eggs, but we wanted to look at temperatures and nest success and all these other factors that go into population assessment. So in addition to the longer full saturation tagging seasons, we also increased the number of nest excavations we did. You can see that on the left. Uh, and that means um, after a nest has hatched, we go in and we pull out the remains and we get an idea of how many eggs actually hatched successfully, how many hatchlings made it to, into the ocean, how many eggs weren't fertilized, that sort of thing. We also started deploying temperature uh, data loggers, which in the center photo is that small orange device there, and that's gonna measure the temperature of the eggs as, the, as they incubate without harming the eggs. And we started using telemetry, so a satellite tag is on the turtle there on the right, bottom right, and taking genetic samples. So deployment of temperature data loggers, the little orange device I mentioned, uh, into the nest at Lalo are especially important um, because they help us predict the Honu population's resilience to climate change when faced with increased global temperatures which for our HONU can lead to skewed sex ratios and even embryonic death, which I'll explain here. So, for example, when we look at the temperature data logger data from East Island in 2018, we can see that the nests that were laid earlier in the season in May, which is shown on the left in blue, they incubated at a cooler temperature than the nests that were laid a few weeks later during the peak season in June, shown there in green, and later in July, which is a reddish brown. Temperature is very important to Honu egg development. Cooler nest temperatures result in longer incubation periods and lower hatch success rate. And warmer temperatures result in shorter incubation periods and can result in greater hatch success rate. Um, as you can see down on the bottom right, so our mean incubation periods for 2018 for the nests that were laid earlier in May and then versus later in July, we had a 20 day difference in how long the eggs were incubating for. So that's a very big difference and can affect their um, success and how long the beach needs to retain those eggs in order for them to hatch successfully. Um, and our peak season, our peak nesting there in green, um, fortunately overlapped with uh, in June with when our nests were most successful, so when they were hatching at the best, at the highest mean hatch success rate. However, green sea turtles, Honu eggs, also have what's called temperature-dependent sex determination. And what that means is that the temperature of the nest environment during the second trimester will, of, of incubation will determine the sex of the, or of the developing embryos. So cooler temperatures in the nest produce male hatchlings and warmer temperatures produce female hatchlings. The temperature at which a given nest will produce both 50% males and 50% females um, is called a pivotal temperature. So that pivotal temperature is something that we're still trying to discover and or determine for Hawaiian population. Um, but if we highlight an estimated pivotal temperature of 29 degrees, and that's the line that's there in purple, we can see how our population in Hawaii might compare to global averages. 29 degrees Celsius is a, a global average for total temperature in other populations. Here we can see that those earlier laid nests incubate at cooler temperatures than the later nests and are more likely to produce male hatchlings. Populations where nesting beach temperatures have already increased, for example, in South Florida, are now heavily female biased and are in risk of losing sustainable breeding ratios. So if your beach is only producing female hatchlings, after years and years of this happening, after 25 to 30 years until these turtles reach maturity, 
you're not gonna have enough males to sustain that population. So it's a really important question that we're looking at now. And we'll take several years of looking at the temperature data and the effects of the hatchlings as they emerge to determine this. If nests get too warm, even warmer than that, they can even suffer from what's called embryonic death and the eggs will actually die before they hatch. For green sea turtles, embryonic death typically takes place starting at only 34 degrees Celsius, which you should be able to see here in red. So very important for us to keep an eye on these temperatures. Uh, the black line here represents the mean temperature of our control data loggers. So these are the data loggers that we didn't put inside nests. They were in just in sand on the beach elsewhere. And having a little delay here. So when we use these data to update our population and climate change models, we're forced to recognize that climate scientists' prediction of a global temperature increase of one to two degrees or more by the year 2100 could have a significant effect on the health and development of our HONU nests, as well as the future sex ratio of the population, as I mentioned. Okay, so what are the other threats facing our population up there? So in addition to increasing global temperatures, we're also studying the HONU population's resilience to catastrophic events and how they can lead to both habitat loss and changes in habitat quality. These events are becoming more important as global climate change leads to sea level rise and more frequent and more intense storms interact with the vulnerable islets in the monument. So one of our research goals is to assess how habitat loss will affect an island's nesting carrying capacity. So, or the amount of nesting that the land on the island can sustain before there are too many nests and too many eggs concentrated in one space, and it actually starts to affect their development and their success. So we're looking at available nesting habitat in the, this atoll at French Frigate Shoal specifically. Well, uh, Whales Gate, uh, it was formerly a significant nesting site at French Frigate Shoals, slowly eroded away during the 1990s and it never came back. It was already not a good sign. Uh, in 2018, while I was up there, um, Frigg Island unexpectedly also eroded away. And it wasn't that small. It was the third largest island at, this, at the time and supported a lot of turtle asking some nesting and uh, Hawaiian monk seal uh, moms and pups. Um, and then at the end of 2018, on October 3rd, just three days after we packed up our camp and set sail for Honolulu, Hurricane Wallaka slammed into French Frigate Shoals with Cat 5 winds that would later rank it as the second strongest tropical cyclone ever recorded in the Central Pacific. We had no idea that this was what this was gonna, how this was gonna affect French Frigate Shoals. And it's very remote, so it's not something we could easily check on. And we had to wait two weeks for satellite imagery to capture what had become of the islet. And we did not expect to see what we did see. And a lot of you probably already seen this imagery. It made the rounds in the media a lot that fall, so in October of 2018. Um, but there it was, East Island, a 2000 year old, uh, primary nesting site of our population was almost, almost completely gone. Um, I put a little tent marker there so you could see where our camp had been just a few days prior. But more importantly than us, um, East Island had also been a permanent home for monk seals and their pups and countless seabirds. So now that East Island uh, was becoming a big questionable you know, is it still a, a good nesting site or not it's going into the 2019 nesting season? Uh, we started thinking about the other islets that were left. So the other islets, shark, round, mullet, and disappearing in yellow there, um, they're all very dynamic. And even in a normal season would often go a wash or get washed over during high tides. So not very good for nesting. Um, the most viable options left for nesting Honu uh, were Kern Island in the north, and two small islets called the Jins in the middle there. Um, but the Jins, I wasn't too hopeful about because you can see they were very small and 
Um, they were each less than half the size of East Island, much more dynamic. They moved a lot. So like I said, that 60 to 90 day incubation period, you really need your island to hold still enough to hold the eggs during that incubation period. Um, so that left Kern Island. Um, and that is that was also the only place left for us to camp. We moved our camp here in 2019. Um, here's what it looked like before and after Hurricane Wallaka. So it was still there in size, but you can see it sustained some damage. And that is where we went in 2019. So we started looking at um, we started looking at the effects of Lalo. Uh, seven, we arrived in May, so seven months after Hurricane Wallaka had eroded it away, we went back to east. And initially it had appeared to grow larger than on that original satellite imagery where it had been reduced to very, very small size. Um, however, during the 2019 season, we observed the island shrinking in both area and elevation. And as the summer progressed, the Turtle nests, as you can see there in the in the smaller image, actually started to wash out of the berm, out of the island, and getting washed away before they had time to hatch. So our program's goal is to continue to monitor the stability of the island and its effectiveness as an incubator for future turtle nesting activity. And for reference, so this is when we arrived uh, in May 2019. That so looks bigger than right after the storm. These were the nests that we recorded uh, during the 2019 nesting season, the nesting pit, the likely nest. Uh, and then this was how the island moved throughout the season. So you can see it started to shift over. And unfortunately, what that resulted in was, as I mentioned, those nests that were washing out of the berm, which of the few we were able to record there in red, those are the red dots, those are nests that were lost. Uh, and for reference, here's the most, the latest imagery we have from East Island. It was from just a few weeks ago, and it's very cloudy, but we can see enough of it to know that East did survive um, Hurricane Douglas, which swung north of here a few weeks ago, as you probably remember. Uh, and so we knew that it was still there, fortunately. Okay, so the, not only are Honu nesting habitats in the monument eroding away, those that remain are becoming degraded and at a rate that is accelerated by catastrophic events. Now we're going to look at habitat quality. So going back to Turn Island, prior to Hurricane Wallaka, Turn Island was heavily vegetated. You can see that thick uh, green-brown vegetation running the whole length of the island. Um, and it went all the way along to the southern berm line. So you see a strip of sand along the south there, and then thick vegetation. And that vegetation was tall and impenetrable, so it consisted mostly of three heliotropes. And in addition to providing bird nesting habitat, the large bushes acted as a natural barrier between the beach and the many potential entrapment hazards, um, such as the former runway in the middle of the island and those old seawalls. Um, that enclosed three sides of the island. So the turtles were not able to get past the vegetation to run into these hazards. Um, because of this barrier, the nests from 2018 prior to the storm um, are all located in yellow there along the southern berm. So the turtles were not able to get past the vegetation to lay their nests. And they were forced to lay it in that nice thick sand right on the southern edge of the island there. Um, so keep an eye on the vegetation line now as I change the image. So the yellow nests, the vegetation line, and there. That's what happened after Hurricane Wallaka in 2019. The hurricane ripped all of that vegetation out, um, deposited on another part of the island, um, killed off the vegetation, and then it also deposited sand across uh, the island. Um, here was South Beach, uh, so looking south. Uh, eight months after Hurricane Wallaka, and you can see very limited vegetation growth. Um, there's a bird there for scale, um, so you can see very low lying and almost zero tree heliotrope. Uh, going back to the map, we can see how different the 2019 nesting looks when I add them here. So in yellow, 2018, and now in pink, that's the 2019 nest after the storm. So even though it looked like there was a lot more 
nesting habitat after the storm because that beach looked bigger. Um, without the barrier, the turtles were free to crawl inland uh, on the old runway and tried to lay their eggs there. Uh, some crossed the runway and actually became entrapped in the northern seawall area, that straight area on the top side of the island. And many more were turned back by field researchers like myself before they needed to be stretcher netted to safety. So again, this initially seemed like a good thing, especially um, considering the loss of all the other nesting habitat in the atoll, like East Island. However, the sand that was deposited on the island wasn't very deep. Um, this is important because, as I mentioned before, sea turtle eggs are very sensitive to temperature. Honu bury their eggs um, to provide some thermal stability that varies with depth. So the deeper the nest, the more stable the temperature uh, when they're exposed to daily fluctuations, day, night, heat. Um, here on the map, you can see the location of depth measurements that we took in 2019. The red markers are very shallow, shallow, less than 20 centimeters. Um, but the, yeah, the green markers are from 40 to 66 centimeters, which 66 was the deepest measurement that we were able to take. But green doesn't necessarily mean that that was a good depth for the egg. Uh, I should note that um, unobstructed beaches, the mean nest depth for green sea turtles is about 68 centimeters. So they really want to be deeper even than 66 centimeters in the sand. So, um, the actual suitable nesting habitat becomes more obvious when I put those, those black dots all represent where nests actually successfully hatched after 60 to 90 days of incubating. And you can see that it's really limited to the areas where you had deeper sand for the turtles to work with and much less nests um, actually hatching. Um, for Kern Island specifically, catastrophic storms also expose many decades old dilapidated structures. You see the old seawalls there, old buildings, um, old water tanks that get exposed, generators. And that can create a potentially deadly obstacle course for nesting females as they crawl up onto the beach to lay their eggs. So uh, last update about what happened this season. So as I already mentioned, I was um, not able to deploy to the Northwesterns. Our field team was dry docked here in Honolulu and worked a lot on data and reporting, um, but we were able to get some information. Um, let's see, so good news. Uh, before the pandemic struck, our field team, team was able to find a gravid or egg bearing female on Oahu up at Laniakea Beach with the help of Malama Honu, our turtle volunteers. Um, and we did an ultrasound, saw that that's how we knew she was egg bearing. And we attached a satellite transmitter and we were able to track her migration north in an effort to better understand how females are responding to the loss or alteration of east. So once they arrived at Penetrated Shoals, what did they do? Did they try to go to east? Did they seek out another islet? That's what we wanted to know. Um, and as I mentioned before, because turtles only migrate every three to four years, we couldn't expect Punahele, our ultrasounded turtle, to know that anything had happened to French frigate shoals in the last three to five years since she had last nested. So our turtles don't know what's going on up there yet. And they're gonna keep going for a few more years and we likely won't see any changes in behavior if they do change their behavior until at least the year 2023. So we're gonna continue trying to satellite tag these turtles as they leave the main Hawaiian Islands and see how they adjust to the new habitat up there. Um, a doc, one, one ship was able to go in, up into the monument this year. It was a documentary team. And uh, because of them and their resource monitor, Andy Sullivan Haskins, our program was able to get a small snapshot of turtle activity in the monument for 2020. The good news is that Andy was able to conduct a census count of basking turtles while on Turn Island and we were very excited about the results. So he got one basking survey in, uh, in July when he was there. Um, first to put his data in perspective, so I'm, I graphed here our basking, so remember the turtles that are coming up during the day to rest. We took a census um, every day in 2017, 18, and 19, and that's the data that's graphed here. Um, and 
the, the orange and blue years, so that's 2017, 2019, those just, uh, the data start a little later because we arrived a little later to the return in that season. Um, so with that in perspective, I can show you that on July 3rd of this year, Andy counted 83 turtles um, asking on term, which is really exciting. We weren't expecting that number at all. It's very high. Um, it falls well above the previous years at a point in the summer when we really start to see that bell curve come down and the numbers dropping off. So that's, um, we don't know exactly what it means yet. We're still piecing together all the little pieces of the puzzle that we received from this summer. But we're hoping it means that that bell curve for this year was much higher. And that's why there's still so many turtles there. Uh, sadly, so the ugly uh, part of 2020, um, Andy also observed four turtles that had become entrapped on turn prior to his July visit. Um, although he was able to save one of them and that's the one on the lower right hand corner. Uh, without our team there to mitigate entrapments and relieve that there were not more fatalities during the season, but Andy's observations highlight the need for a more permanent solution to the issues on Turn Island. And fortunately, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife and the Papahana Mokuleke Marine Debris Project, among others, are teaming up this fall to try and tackle some of the issues facing Turn um, and the wildlife there that interacts with it. So I'll wrap up with a few threats about our turtles. So why are turtles endangered in general or threatened like our population? So in many areas, they're still, and, and historically, they were har harvested and over-harvested. The green sea turtles harvested for their meat primarily. And hawksbill sea turtles, the other turtle you hopefully will see around the main Hawaiian Islands, uh, has that beautiful tortoise shell pattern on their shells. And that's actually what tortoise shell jewelry was traditionally made of. Uh, today, uh, in the, and in the main Hawaiian Islands, you'll see um, turtles getting accidentally captured in fishing nets or lines, eating plastic, um, getting, uh, uh, there's, if there's vehicles driving on the beaches, um, getting struck by boats, unfortunately, are some of the reasons some of the turtles that we work with um, at our facility, they become stranded. A lot of them are fishing line entanglements and boat strikes. Um, so how can people help? Um, we want to try and get these turtles off the endangered species list. Uh, so if you buy or if you use re, re, uh, less plastic, reusable trash bags, don't release any balloons, pick up any litter you see on the beach. And if you are a fisher person, a very exciting campaign that I believe Irene Kelly will talk more about in two weeks. But it is OK to help if you are fishing and you accidentally hook a turtle. Um, the biggest threat to turtles is that the fishing line gets tangled in their flippers. And so uh, Irene and her coworkers work with uh, training fishermen to safely reel in turtles and to cut the line um, so that the line doesn't um, entangle the turtles and the hook will actually fall out by itself. So uh, this is an effort to prevent uh, folks that are fishing from just cutting the line where it is if they catch a turtle. We want to make sure we try and get rid of as much of that fishing line as possible. That is the most dangerous part. And if you see an injured or distressed turtle or Hawaiian monk seal or other uh, marine wildlife, there is a hotline number, Hawaiian Marine Animal Response. And that is uh, statewide. You can call that number and HMR will come and respond um and help with the uh with the animal it's a really great program and the last thing is because we have to paint our turtles up in the northwestern hawaiian islands with this little non-toxic painted number it allows us to see the turtles from further away so we don't disturb them as much but when these turtles migrate back to the main hawaiian islands people see the numbers they actually last for a few months so we ask folks citizen scientists you please help us and report the numbers. Um, uh, it's called uh, the Honu Count uh, Citizen Science Project. So it updates every year. Unfortunately, we don't have a 2020 because we didn't go up. Um, but if you email uh, respectwildlife at noaa.org, uh, um, and to let us know that you've seen the turtle, where you saw it, what number, You'll actually get a response from our team with the history of that turtle, 
when and where it was tagged, uh, where it swam from. So really interesting. Some of these turtles um, that we encounter were tagged in the 80s. They have an incredible history and it's a really fun project that we have to work with the community. So with that, um, thank you very much. I, I will, I'm happy to stick around for questions, but I don't know if I have time or if everyone else has time, but um, thank you very much. So if anybody has any questions, uh, please feel free to ask. Um, I actually got one for you, Mary Lou. Uh, I know the pivotal temperature is the main, I guess, deciding factor of the sexes. Is there any other, is there a reason why cold um, leads to males and warm leads to females? Or is it just because of that temperature? That's a, that's a great question. And in terms of why this evolved, mm -hmm. I'm not entirely sure why that, why that's the mechanism. Mm -hmm. but the way it works naturally is that a big clutch of eggs, a hundred eggs sitting in this little hole, mm -hmm. The eggs on the inside are naturally kept warmer mm -hmm. by their siblings mm -hmm. on the outside. And so the, the metabolic heating, the heating of all the eggs together means that the, the hatchlings, the embryos developing in the middle of the clutch are warmer females. Okay. And on the outside, where they're exposed more to the environment, are cooler and generally produce males. So naturally, there's a nice balance. Mm -hmm. It's when the overall climate and, and the temperatures of the environment increase, increase, increase. Mm -hmm. The outer temperature is already past the threshold for males. Oh, okay. Male. Okay. But I, I don't know the answer to why that evolved. It's a very yeah. interesting um, evolutionary uh, yeah. that they have. And I know that uh, I think marine crocodiles have it as well, but opposite. Mm -hmm. okay. it's cooler females and warmer males, I believe. Okay. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else got any questions? If you have a question, you can unmute your microphone. <laughs> I put one in the chat. Okay. To her. Okay, I can't see the chat. Gavin, can you see yeah, it? Yes, she can. Kind of funny. Um, what was your question? Um. Okay, when I was little, a scientist told me that people have funguses under their fingernails that doesn't bother us, but if it gets on a sea turtle, it would make them really sick. I know it's illegal to touch them, but I was just wondering if what that scientist said was true or not. <laughs> or if you knew. I have, I have not heard of the under fingernail uh, <laughs> danger specifically. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that Turtles, more likely, um, turtles, so uh, especially freshwater turtles, uh, carry salmonella. Uh, so it, that, that is dangerous to people. Um, marine turtles, especially here in Hawaii, uh, have what's called uh, fibropapilloma virus. So they get these tumors. And those are, um, those are not, if you've ever you might have you might have heard of this or seen that turtles get tumors on their skin and it can be um, fatal if it blocks their vision, blocks their uh, eating. Um, so they have that, and that's very contagious between turtles. Um, it is a type of herpes virus, which we're still researching the uh, likely cause uh, because we see turtles with tumors, uh, greater tumors in areas of human population. We don't see it in remote areas as much. There is the theory that's being pursued that it is caused by runoff or be, uh, um, somehow related to being adjacent to these highly populated areas. And because it is a herpes virus related to human um, HPV. So um, I'm not sure about that. I haven't heard the fingernail thing uh, um, specifically. There's Certainly things that we don't want to give to turtles and that turtles don't want, shouldn't give, or we don't want from turtles. The not touching sea turtles is more about um, 
it's more about making sure that they're getting their rest and not getting harassed. So for example, turtles, um, we have a few theories for why they bask on land, um, thermal regulation, escaping from large predators like tiger sharks, but it's a natural part of their life that they need to do. And so disturbing a turtle on the beach and causing it to flush back in the water disrupts, um, disrupts that turtle a lot and disrupts what it's trying to do. Um, they also, if you, the, the one that worries me is when people are snorkeling or diving and they pursue a turtle, turtles are reptiles. They need to breathe air from the surface. And so turtles will instinct, instinctually dive down and to get away from snorkelers or divers and to escape. And especially when this happens is when they're coming up to the surface to try and get a breath and they'll panic and they'll get scared and they'll dive down. And that can be really dangerous for turtles. So the best thing is if you see a turtle in the water, if you see a turtle on the beach more than 10 feet away, please let the turtle rest, let the turtle recover and do its thing, thermal regulate. If you see a turtle in the ocean, especially important, don't move. I like to just kind of tuck myself because they're curious. A lot of them will come close to you. If you reach out for them, if you try to, you know, disturb them, um, you might not take that breath that they really need and they might swim away. So hold still, let the turtle come up to the surface, take a breath and respect. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, thanks. Anybody else got any questions? You guys can unmute your microphone. I don't want to unmute everybody because we can hear everything. <laughs> Am I unmuted? Can you hear me? Is yes. it clear? Yeah, I can hear you. I sent two chats in. Uh, the first one is I didn't know how the eggs are fertilized. Oh, the, so the when the females migrate up to their nesting grounds, for example, at French Frigate Shoals, Males will also migrate oh. and they'll mate while they're up there. So we'll see them in the waters around Turn Island, East Island, and the male will go on top of the female and um, grab onto her shell. And turtles have what's called cloaca, so they'll put their tails together. The cloacas will touch, and um, a penis from the male cloaca will go into the female and the eggs will get fertilized. And what's really interesting about that is that turtle, uh, female turtles have what's called sperm storage. And so they'll mate with the males during that first month that they're up there, but then the males leave. We won't see the males for the rest of the summer. And just the females are left for the two, three months laying their eggs. And so they don't mate again. They'll mate with maybe a few males in the beginning, and then they'll store that sperm so that every clutch that they grow between laying their eggs, they'll, they'll grow, they'll develop um, another 100 eggs, will be fertilized um, from just the mating that she did at the beginning of the season. Uh -huh. And furthermore, eggs inside each nest will be a mix of all the fathers that she made it with. Wow. It's really interesting. Is, is there any fresh water on the atoll where you stay for six months? There is not. No. So we have to bring it all in, uh, in many, many jugs of water. Uh, we use these large five gallon reusable army style jugs that we use every year. Um, there is on Lay San, it's one of the islands in the Northwestern and I believe Midway, they both have fresh water or more of a saline lake and that's where you'll find the lay sand duck so they have an uh, in uh like an inland lake but the islands at french frigate shoals are not large enough and they don't have an aquifer or anything we can tap into and you don't have any kind of a catchment situation if it rains we catch water have uh, rainwater in buckets We'll get these uh, incredible squalls that'll roll through. We'll have to tighten up the tents, get some buckets outside, and we use the rainwater for laundry oh. and for bathing. So, because we bathe in the ocean otherwise, it's kind of nice to have a freshwater bath occasionally. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Claire. Anybody else got any questions? I have another one if, any, if nobody else has. 
Um, so if the nesting sites are destroyed and the females are going up there to try and lay their eggs and they can't, what happened? Like, will she just hold the eggs in? Or, like, what happens to the turtle if she can't lay her eggs? So, well, we know that turtles can, if they go up to lay um, their eggs at night and they don't find a location that they like, they'll come up a few nights in a row. So it's not like they have to lay their eggs at night. Um, and that we, we've seen, actually, we saw that a lot more with turtles not loving the nesting area on turn in 2019 they would come up night after night looking for a suitable spot but that's you know that's we're just talking about nights um we know that turtles that don't have a suitable place to lay their eggs for example uh, turtles that live in aquariums their whole lives will actually dump their eggs in the water uh, if they don't have a place to haul out so it could be that some eggs get dumped out into the ocean um, it could be that some of the eggs get reabsorbed by the female for energy for her migration back. Um, but if they're, you know, she has really solid um, shelled eggs ready, ready to go, she's likely going to dump them. The next nearest place that they could lay from French Frigate Shoals is lay sand but that's over 500 kilometers away and we don't know that they have any kind of homing instinct to get there so that is really the the question brooke so we're going to be looking the next few years we're hoping that turn island sticks around and that that will be a suitable nesting habitat for the turtles obviously we need to clean it up and that is something as i mentioned is being worked on to make the just the quality of the habitat better um, but it's something that we have initially talked about the last five years as putting into our models. Oh, what will happen with climate change over the next 50 or 100 years? And then, boom, it happened in 2018, something very catastrophic. So we've had to readjust our thinking into what might possibly happen and what might possibly we do into now all of a sudden this happened, it's happening what do we do? And the best thing we can do right now is not to react and try and interfere in a way that might cause more harm. The best thing we can do is to continue researching what the turtles are doing, monitor their movements, see how they're adjusting naturally, and then support them in what they naturally choose to do. Because it's before we get to mm, an, uh, uh, human intervention, it's really best to just support what their natural instinct is and to because there are things like we can relocate nests that is a pretty last resort because it is um it's not really feasible to move the number of nests that we're we're getting up there but there are things that you might have heard that in other places though in florida they move their nests you know can we do that can we build the beaches back up <clears throat> And there are, we are in our research team, we are part of uh, long-term management groups. So just for the, <clears throat> the management of Turn Island, we are looking into these scenarios, <clears throat> excuse me, and what, what might happen and what we could do, potentially. Excuse me. Good question. <laughs> Anybody else got any questions? Hey, Mary Lou, do you want to give um, like maybe your contact, maybe your email in case anybody has questions later on? Yeah, of course. So oh, I'm sorry. Um, let me see how I can do this. <laughs> um, what would be the easiest way? So I'm going to go back to my first yeah. one real quick. So my email is my first and last name at noah.gov. So it's Mary Lou Damon. <laughs> I, I broke it now. I'm sorry, I'm not seeing the um oh here it is. Okay. So my okay. name is right there. The I, I don't have access to the chat, unfortunately. So someone else could write it. I'll type really it in helpful. for you. No problem. Yeah, Thank you. <laughs> 
Okay, so it's my my Mary Lou dot Stamen at Noah dot gov. I'd be super happy to take anyone's questions as they come up in the future. Um, and yeah, there was a, was someone able to send it in the chat? Yeah. Okay, thanks so much. I'm sorry, I'm not WebEx is not cooperating with yeah, me. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. I can't mute myself. I can't chat. It's, yeah. uh, it's just. We'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. out. We'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, it went really well. It's uh, seven forty-five. Um, but yeah, thank you very much for giving a very informative presentation. And for those of you who joined online, thank you guys, and hope you guys can make it for next week when we have Christina um, Copper. How do you say her name? Copper. Copper Rat. Top and wrap. Um, so yeah, you guys have all a great night and we'll see you next week. Same all right, time. thank you so much.